Um, how's my camera? Here's a here's an honest question: Is mm -hmm. it better like this or like this? <laughs> Didn't you want a catchphrase? Oh, it's coming! Woo! <laughs> Here it comes at the end. The thing I want to point out, okay, so I touched on the fact that this is like doing something new, right? This is way out of the box for me. This is more in line with the th types of things you do and you're around on a regular basis. Yes, it's not you in front of the camera, but this is kind of your world now. This is definitely not my world anymore. <clears throat> Anything anything even remotely close to this. So, and the fact that I'm an introvert and I have to like, so mentally I have to, when we're going to be meeting new people and we're going to be interacting, asking questions and all that kind of stuff, like I have to mentally get into the space where I have to like go with the flow. I got to be okay with it. And so in my head, I went, okay, ready? Ebb and flow. Here we go. That's it. Oh, that's your pun that, uh, Ebb and uh, flow. Uh, here we go. End of each episode. Speechless. Wait, 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 wait. That's your catchphrase, Edmund yeah, Flo, and Here we go to to get into the episode. That the end of our little intros, and that's how we start. And we know we're starting to go into the episode that we've recorded and edited. All right, let me try it. Ready? So you do this. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Ebb and flow. Here we go. See, but now my insecurity of how I'm, I'm going to hear it back, and it's going to be all slurred. If you have any insecurities, never start a podcast. I slur all of my words together. I'm a mumble mouth. It's it's really unbelievable when I hear myself talk. I, I think people honestly just uh, agree with me half the time to hear me just so I stop talking. Anyway. Okay. You ready for my thing? Do you know how when you're picking your... <laughs> Are you familiar with the term snot rocket? Yes. So sometimes there's like, you got to use your finger and plug the other side. <laughs> plug the dude, other I, side. I, I, honestly, dude, I'm, I, dude, you know how weak my stomach is, man. I, you told <laughs> Dude. I'm you told to God, me dude, that I, wasn't a problem anymore. I didn't, I didn't realize <laughs> until this exact moment that it was still a problem. Dude, here's the thing. I'm like locked into this chair. I can't even like move. <laughs> to go throw Dude. up? Yes. <laughs> Dude, I have a bucket now. I'm literally moving this bucket over. We don't we don't have to talk about it. Dude, I, uh, I don't think I don't, can. I don't Dude, my eyes are watering <laughs> like I'm about to. Never mind. We won't talk about it. Ugh. Whew. Oh, so Steve God. Trevino. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> the whole thing with the Steve Trevino episode, I mean, like, you want to be a stand-up comedian. You want it. You, what, sure. But it, deep down, that's like a core thing for you. Your Fozzie Bear waka 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 your entire life situation is... <laughs> is proof that you've always that's why you gravitate to it that's why you're so fascinated by the business associated with it and whatever like that because and you've always you've always been the type to try and get a laugh yes and and that's a great kind of intro to this episode because it, it this was one of our first this was first or second uh interview we ever did and so our footing it certainly isn't there i kind of sure. dominate the the conversation though um but I know him, like him and I are yeah, friends. It so. makes of course. Yeah, yeah. It's, it makes complete sense that you would have a lot of natural back and forth. And you guys have had your own experiences of things you can riff off of. So, yeah, it made sense. For those who don't know, Steve Trevino is a stand up comedian. His uh, this is he's got five specials out there. I directed two of them. And then now he's got a Netflix special, Simple Man. Um, it's coming out. Well, from the time this is released, it's coming out a week later on March 12th. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, we're releasing this the week of March 12th, right? Or maybe. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it was. Happening. Yeah. We're releasing it around the Netflix, uh, the Netflix premiere, premiere which is cool. Yeah. You're coming down for, 
you're coming down for there's the Rebecca Creek premiere on Sunday. Then we have the Tobin Center premiere on Monday. And then we have the true Netflix premiere on Tuesday. And we're going to have a bunch of people at the house. So I'm, I'm excited that you're coming down. Yeah, I'm excited to come down we, too. We get to celebrate. Is Steve at any of that stuff? Steve will be at Rebecca Creek and Tobin. He can't come to my house because I think he's going to do press that week. Ah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Because yeah. I've, I've only met him on the podcast. I haven't met him in person. So, um, so yeah. So here's our interview with Steve Trevino. Well, as, as we say in the business, ebb and flow, here we go. What's up, guys? How's it going, Mr. Trevino? <laughs> well, I'm the only one not in an official-looking studio, but here. <laughs> That's the important thing, is that you're here. You guys look like experts on a history documentary or something. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when you said, this was a couple weeks back, you were like, uh, I'm not going on any more podcasts. I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. One more, one more. Well, you know, I just got to make sure that, that we don't say any, that we're not nice to anybody because anytime I'm nice to anybody, it goes viral. So. Yeah, just be mean. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, well, welcome, Steve Trevino. Steve, this is, uh, I got to be honest, as much as we've hung out, have, uh, I've interviewed you, I've worked with you for 20 years, I'm a little nervous right now. Well, it's, uh, it is one of those things where I'm like, wait a minute, it, it, is Rick interviewing me? Or, I, I don't know what's happening. I don't know if this is like, is this a business call? Yeah. I'm pulling an interview out of this whole thing. We're just hanging out <laughs> and we're that. chatting about stuff. That's how this is, that, that's how this is going for sure. All right, Steve, uh, Eric, obviously nice to meet you. Pleasure, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, should I call you Steve or you like leg show? Leg show's good. You know, leg show, uh, big cock. I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, from, uh, from who? From who? <laughs> From my two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say it. I was thinking it, but I wasn't going to say it. And here we are back on TMZ. Yeah, back in, back canceled. <laughs> Steve, I'll let you tell the story. So we did an intro for you that kind of talks about how big you are and amazing and all that stuff. Uh, why don't we make this personal? Let's give your side of how you and I met. Well, oh, well, shoot, dude. I, you know, it, it was... I, I, and the funny part is I think that me and you were the two people that did not fit in that world. So we were definitely uh, feeling the outsider-ish of it. And if I felt like an outsider and I am Latino, I can't imagine how this white boy from Detroit felt hanging out on La Esquina, you know, with these pretty much gangsters uh, is how we met, is hanging out on a corner trying to get Pitbull to cooperate with us, which in the beginning he did. And then uh, it was me and you in a uh, rental uh, apartment uh, for weeks and weeks listening to a song that, dude, even if I hear it now, like, I'm like, oh, I, it, you know, that's one song. I forget what it is, but it was the intro. And I remember sitting Bo Jangles. Bo Jangles. And I remember sitting behind you and just hearing that over and, and I'm <laughs> over and over, over and, and over again. Like, I like Pitbull, but this song, fuck this song. So when I hear that <laughs> song, it takes me back 20 years to me and you. By the way, I don't know if you remember this. No furniture. None. None. We, we had yeah. no furniture in this house. And it was us on a laptop trying to get this show together. But I will say, Rick, that... It was a perfect introduction to the can-do attitude. Yeah. You know, it, it was one of those things where it was like, here's two cameras, here's two cameramen, here's one director, here's a producer, here's a writer. Y'all go make something happen. And I, I'm pretty proud of what we did. I'm very proud of it. And, you know, it was really kind of when the internet, I mean, you certainly weren't watching shows on the internet. So when we were doing it, we were doing it with the idea that, this was going to live on the internet. Right. And, um, and so I'm actually kind of proud that it, it went to network, but the, the, the kind of challenges, the, the core La Esquina is still online today. And it, um, you, where were you in your career at that point? So I, I was, I was, I was just coming off writing on the mind of NC on comedy central and CBS was doing this kind of diversity showcase 
uh, which is CBS's way of going, see, we're not racist. We have a, we have <laughs> a whole little group for you uh, ethnic people, right? Um, and then we did this showcase, and that's when Dave hit me up, and he goes, I understand you're a writer. Can you write this show? And he goes, and I forget what the number was, and I don't want to say it, but at that time, I was like, yeah, for 2500 bucks, I'm in. Like, it was, it yeah. was no money, but, but enough to make me go, I'll do that. You know, and then I don't know if you know this, Rick, but I, I had met I had met Pitbull probably a year a year before that. And at that time, uh, he was with DJ Laz. DJ Laz is telling me, oh, this kid's gonna blow up. And he goes, We're going to strip clubs tonight. And I'm like, strip clubs in Miami, I'm in. Well, back then they would walk in with the C V and hand it to the DJ, pay the DJ a hundred bucks to play it. And then they'd play it. Pitbull would do his thing and, and walk around and shake hands. And then it was the next strip club. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. I haven't got comfortable yet. I, I haven't even picked the girl out. <laughs> like, give me a second. Uh -oh. But that's how I met Pitt. And it was the Kulo song. So I already knew him. And then when they go, hey, do you want to work with this guy Pitbull? I'm like, yeah, because, you know, he really is a very genuine, sweet guy. And I loved hanging out with him. And he was... And especially back then, he was very, very humble. You remember Rick? I mean, Rick and oh, I yeah. got yeah. Rick and I got to kind of see the trajectory from us to what a year later or two years later when we came back. Yeah, yeah. And so, Steve, just giving you a little bit of Eric's background. Eric and I started an app company. Of course, we went to the well and got Pitt to do it. So we spent three months with Pitt on the road. So with you, I saw when he was basically playing small, small clubs. And then with Eric, I got to see him in stadiums. And it is, yeah. it is impressive. It was unbelievable, man. And, and, you know, Renee and I, he had come to California to do some club. And, and he texted me and he's like, hey, come out, see the show. And we show up. And I just remember it was like this little ghetto club. And Pitbull's like, I'm not going on stage until I get a suitcase of, ca suitcase of cash. And they literally brought him up. He wouldn't go on stage until they brought him the cash, you know? And, I'm, and he opens up the suitcase like a drug dealer and goes, all right, I'm going on. And it was just one of those things. But, but you, even then, you kind of felt the excitement of something happening. That's actually a pretty good transition um, to, to, to your career. So obviously the, the idea behind this is kind of defining moments and we always say it that you could have gone right but you went left and you are where you are so do you have obviously if you look now everyone says oh you made it and it was an easy road and all this you know because you're at the the popularity side of it cut back to when you were sleeping in your car it, was there a moment that you said to yourself i'm done like either i, I I'm going to knock it out of the park or I'm going home. Well, not, not in the beginning. And, you know, even when I was living in my car, I never had the attitude of like, I'm quitting. Cause I was, that was the beginning. And it was like, Oh, well, it's going to be, you, you know, you still have in your head. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. I'm coming to LA in a few months. I'll be working on the mind of Mencia. Cause that's why I had moved. And I knew that I had a job coming up. If the TV show got picked up, I was, at that time, I was working on the presentation. They, back then, they wouldn't even film a pilot. They would do a live stage presentation. So um, I knew I had a job coming. I was already moving to L.A. I had already been on the road. And, and there was, uh, for me, I thought that that Comedy Central show was going to be my defining moment. You know, I, I would get small parts on it. Uh, once we were filming, um, I was a writer. I would do the warm up. Um, in front of all of Comedy Central, at, at that time, um, uh, two executives that were part of the show were, were coming up to me saying, oh, you're so funny and you're so great and you're going to have this big career. And I'm just like, oh, of course I am. You know, it wasn't until I left all of that, did the Skina, and then there was this kind of in-between stage of me going out and headlining but I was like the $1,500 a week headlining guy, you know? And I was happy in the beginning to take those and go, oh man, I'm headlining now. Which by the way, when I look back on it, I do realize that I was very lucky because number one, I've been doing stand-up 
professionally since I was 20 years old. Now I'm 25, 26. I was like, there was that moment of, oh yeah, I'm headlining. And then, man, that's it. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be famous. And then it was four years into doing the grind of $1,500 a week, Wednesday through Sunday, you know, where, you know, when you look at $1,500 a week, people don't realize that, you know, my rent in LA was 1800 bucks. And, you know, I had to pay a manager 150 bucks. I had to pay an agent 150 bucks. And then the government takes their money. And then I've got to get out to the gig. I mean, so roughly I would come home with, you know, probably 700 bucks a, a, a week. It wasn't until the grind of that kind of made me go, all right, like nothing's happening. I, I keep going out there. The bigger frustration was that I, I knew I was good. You know, I would kill and I would, I never had a problem being funny. And I started watching my peers who started kind of when I did, boom, they're on TV shows. They're booking the TV show Punk. They're booking sitcoms. They're booking movies. And here I was on the road going, man, what, what am I doing? And then the other defining moment was meeting Renee, who is now my wife. And But that was the moment for me because when I fell in love with her, I hated her for it. Yeah. And I know that's a really crummy thing to say, but I really hated her for making me fall in love with her because she made me change my lifestyle. So that's when I walked on stage and found my voice because I started bitching about her on stage and how I, you know, she's not fair and I have to follow these rules. She doesn't have to follow those rules. And then all of a sudden I had found this thing that was really funny, but the hate still came out. So it didn't, it didn't quite resonate. It, it wasn't the big defining moment was me as a man being okay with being in love with her, that the comedy, the comedy started to come out in a, my frustration came out of love and not hate. And that was a huge defining moment for me. And so go back to that, that moment. What was the first joke that you said, this is my voice? Do you remember what it is? I, I remember walking on stage and it had just happened at my house. And I went to the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard, and I walked on stage and I go, what kind of animal squeezes the toothpaste from the middle? <laughs> and then everybody started laughing, but I had literally just brushed my teeth to go out. Renee had left the, the Colgate all, like it got his ass kicked, right? And I'm sitting there, I'm pissed. I'm like, this woman, how many times have I told her, you roll it, you freaking roll it, make it tight. You clean it, right? It has to be clean, tight. And I walk on stage and I go, what kind of fucking animal squeezes the toothpaste from the middle? And then I remember getting this reaction from the audience that I go, oh, wow, how can something so simple get such a reaction from people? Huh. That, that to me was the one joke that I go, oh, I can talk about the... the, the I don't want to use the wrong word. The the the, the idiosyncrasies is that what it's called? Like idiosyncrasies. The, yeah. Yeah. Idiosyncrasies yeah. of my marriage and my relationship, and find something really funny in it. And once I had that joke, then it was like, oh, I want to talk about the details of frustration with my with the girl. It's just universally uh, relatable, right? That's it's almost that's as if you should name a special relatable. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, and, and, and that's what happened, right? Is, is I, I wanted to be this comedian that, that talked about everything. So in Relatable, you know, I, I, I have a gay cousin. He's one of my best friends. I wanted to, I wanted to attack um, uh, homosexuality in a, from a male perspective in Relatable. I'm really proud of that joke, but nobody ever talks about it. They just talk about the second half when I talk about my wife. That is what, what really resonated with people. Even though I was very proud to have written this joke about, you know, you don't choose to be gay, right? Because if you could, I would choose it, <laughs> right? I mean, two male incomes, you know, and, and I gave this, you know, 
I gave this great list. You know, nobody talks. You just sit there and watch TV. You know, I, I wish, you know, the gays are upset because marriage is illegal for them. I go, shoot, I wish it was illegal for us. <laughs> you know, there would have been nothing better to look at her and go, baby, we can't. It's illegal. <laughs> you can live here, but none of this shit is yours. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I was really proud of that joke. And it and it didn't it didn't resonate with the audience until I started talking about my frustration with my wife, the love I have for her, and all the little details is what really resonated. And then that's when I go, oh, this is what I need to be talking about. One thing about Renee, um, Captain Evil. One thing. One well, just just the one thing. It, well, let me say the one thing that I see knowing you guys for as long as I have. You guys are so in sync as a team, as a business, as a couple, and, and even going back to Relatable, can you kind of talk about that? Uh, and, and the story's out there of you self-funding it, you, you decide we're going to put up billboards. And if you can maybe give our audience a, a quick synopsis of that, because I have a ton of questions based around that moment. Here, here is how in sync me and my wife are. Uh, last night here in Marco Island, uh, Naples, I'm doing a show we get in the car with our friends and one of my buddies goes, I took a picture of your picture on the wall and your, your picture is right above Kevin Hart's. And then I said, I go, that's because I'm a little taller than him. <laughs> well, the whole car started laughing because they go, oh my God, that's exactly what Renee said an hour ago. Wow. <laughs> Renee made the same joke without us knowing an hour later, but... You know, for, for me and Renee is, is we were going at this together and we needed to succeed together. And Renee being um, uh, Stella Adler, Tish, NYU, you know, she studied acting, she studied producing, she studied all those things. And it, was, it only made sense to me that she be my director, my producer, my partner, because we were already partners in life. And we had to make this thing happen together. Now, don't get me wrong. It took a long time to get Renee to kind of put her individual career on the side and then kind of join forces with me. But once that happened, uh, we just became more and more uh, effective and efficient. And I'm the dreamer and she's a, the realist. So that, that team really makes things happen because... You know, when I went to her and said, nobody's going to give me another special, we have to do it ourselves. Renee immediately said, well, how and with who and where and who do we need to talk to and how does that work? And I'm going, I don't know how the fuck it works. We're going to do it. You know, so Renee immediately became that partner. So the idea is you guys said, no one's going to give you a, a special. We're going to do it ourselves and you're going to film it in your hometown, right? Is that where you filmed it? So you, you took out billboards. And at this time, and I, and I, you know I love talking about the business side of comedy, which we'll get to in a second here. But at this point, you're not independently wealthy to just say, I'm going to go in. And I had no money, so let's go take a step back. We had filmed, I had gotten a deal with Showtime to film Grandpa Joe's Son, and it was about to hit the airwaves on Showtime. I only had enough money to put billboards up in Corpus Christi, but my thought was, if people in Corpus Christi think I'm famous and they see the special, then I will always sell tickets in my hometown. So that's when I put up the billboards. But what I did was I also put those billboards up promoting a show of me coming to town. Steve Trevino, watch him on Showtime, watch him live, so that I could then do a show, pay for those billboards, and I could make myself famous in Corpus. So that I knew anytime I went to Corpus, I could make some real money to sustain myself throughout the year, right? All the other clubs I'm headlining making 1500 bucks, I'm self-promoting shows in Corpus making 10, 12,000, which that was my way of staying afloat. So then I thought, okay, if we're gonna film a special, let's go film it where I know I can fill the room. And I know people think I'm a star, love me, care about me. So that's why we did the billboards for the Showtime thing that then led to me being able to get a crowd for relatable. But the the money side of it, that you guys are putting, you're sinking 
all your money into this special, it has to work, right? I mean, isn't that the mentality? Has to. Let me put it this way. We set up Relatable in an arena. The rent was 30 grand. Roger Kreger was 20 grand. Oh, jeez. And then production was another 100 grand. Now, production wasn't going to take their money until they sold it, which was nice. However, I still had to pay the rent of 30 grand, and I still had to pay Roger Kreger, who I had performing with me, 20 grand, 50 grand. I don't have any money in the bank, zero. And the money I did have, I used to build the set and um, produce the show, which was very little. Now, all of a sudden, I've got to sell tickets. If I don't sell those tickets, I don't pay the 30 grand back to the venue, and Roger Kreger doesn't get paid. So that night for that show that broke my career, Roger Kreger's making 20 grand and I'm literally making, I think I made 400 bucks. But so what are the conversations leading up to that? Are you stressed? Is Renee stressed? (laughs) Renee's way more stressed than me, you know? And then I get a phone call two weeks before the show from the, the bank center and they go, Steve, you've sold zero tickets. This is three weeks. So I literally get in my car in Los Angeles. I say, I'm on my way. I call every radio station friend I know. And I go, guys, I got to do press. I got to do radio. I drove down to um, Corpus Christi, which is a 20 hour drive. Got on the radio, did four, five, six radio stations, stayed with my parents, turned around and drove back. And they called and they go, holy shit, Steve, you just sold 2000 tickets. I'm like, thank God. And they go, well, that paid our rent. So I still have no money. I still owe Roger Kreger 20 grand. I still got to get down there. I still got to make sure that the, the set is built. And I go, holy shit, we ended up selling 6,000 tickets, which basically netted me 400 bucks. Wow, Jesus. And then so from that special. I thought that was going to be, I thought it was going to be a defining moment on me for me because we had sold it to Netflix And at that time, there was very few comedy specials on Netflix. And anybody that was getting on Netflix was blowing up. So I I told my wife, I said, it's going to work. We're on Netflix now. Well, back then, you could put reviews on people's stuff. I look at, there's three reviews, and they just shit on them. Really? These guys are like, "This this guy's just talking. I don't get it. He's some redneck from Texas. And I just went, oh, my God. It's not doing what we thought it was going to do. And then I, you know, we, we reach out to Netflix. Netflix goes, yeah, we don't promote your special. You are, you're acquired. So you're on your own to promote it. That's when we started doing the little clips. All of a sudden, my life literally changed within. And the crazy part is I'm performing in Corpus Christi and I'm going, holy crap, I don't know what's going on. But I had 10,000 Facebook fan page followers and it was growing by the tens of thousands every few minutes. And I would refresh and 5,000 more would come in and I'd refresh. And I mean, that clip for that moment in time was on everybody's, everybody's page. Was there a moment after that, that you turned to Renee and said, this worked? Well, so I, 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 you know, I used to pick up a gig at the Brea Improv because I knew the manager and it was a Wednesday night gig. He would pay me 200 bucks to come out and headline on a Wednesday. I called him up and I said, hey, I want to headline next Wednesday. And he goes, same deal. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I go, I go, I want to, I want a door deal. I don't know what's happening, but I want a door deal. And he goes, Steve, I just pulled up your numbers. You sold 30 tickets last time you were here which was five months ago. And I go, yeah, I'm willing to take the risk. In 45 minutes, we sold out one, put a second show on, sold out another one. I made $16,000 on a Wednesday. My life has never been the same. Wow. Which is a great segue into the business of comedy. Talk to me about the first piece of merchandise you had. What's the first thing that you sold that was yours? I'm so embarrassed. I hate that you ask this, but, but I will be honest. I had, when I was working at the radio station, I wanted to be on the radio. And one of the DJs goes, well, you got to have a name, right? 
So like a friend of mine, he was on the country radio. I already love where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> he was Cactus Lou, right? Cactus Lou Ramirez here coming at you at, you know, K99 radio, Cactus Lou, right? And uh, uh, I go, okay, well, I'm going to be the sexy Mexi from South Texas. <laughs> right? So... I made these shirts that said, I'm a sexy Mexi. And on the back, it said, I put out, right? (laughs) (laughs) It's so embarrassing to talk about. I got tears. I made myself. How how much did you sell it for? Oh, I forget. It was like 15 bucks. And people are buying them. And, you know, sexy Mexi from South Texas shirts, you know, and. But I, I, I'll tell you that I'm glad you asked me that question because uh, Lawrence Fishburne, is it, who was on Pee Wee's Playhouse? It was Lawrence, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're about to do an interview. I'm in Chicago on Man Cow. You know Man Cow. Yep. The radio DJ. And he's about to interview Lawrence Fishburne. And he goes, the shitty part is we cannot ask him about Pee Wee's Playhouse. We're not allowed to. Oh, and at that moment, I made myself a promise that I would never, I would never be embarrassed of my past, right? That I would, oh, okay. that I wouldn't, I wouldn't take anything off limits, right. right? So when you asked me that, I would have much rather said, ah, I'd rather not talk about it. But I had already made myself a promise that I would be honest with the sexy Mexi. <laughs> uh, which is outstanding and. Certainly, uh, we're going to have to get shirts made up again. Um, <laughs> what I'm always fascinated with is even going back to like you saying $1,500 a week to most people, that sounds like a lot of money. And I'm glad you broke it down that you have managers, agents, stuff. But even to kind of take a step back from that, when you say door deal, what is a door deal as opposed to just getting paid up front? I get 80% of the ticket. Okay. So if a ticket is, if a ticket's a hundred bucks, I get 80 bucks, right? Right. Um, the venue, the venue gets 20%. And the more tickets I sell, I'm now at, you know, 80, 85%, sometimes 90% of the door because um, the club knows that at this point in my career, I don't need anything from them. I need the stage, the microphone, that's it because I don't need you guys to do an email blast. I don't need you guys to answer phones. The tickets are going to sell with very little effort because it's my socials and my things that are selling. So you start to be able to take more and more of the door and we don't touch the, the, the food and beverage. So they're basically running a restaurant and you know, this club, for example, holds 250 seats. We've sold out six shows times 250 seats. Well, you know, that is nachos and dinners and drinks. And, you know, so any restaurant would be happy. Tonight I'm doing three shows. Any restaurant would be happy with 750 patrons coming through their doors for dinner. Yeah. And Bray, when you sold 30 and you're going to take a door deal, that was a big chance as well. Oh, a huge chance. Because, you know, I, I mean, literally months before I had sold only 30 tickets. Right. We had, we had 150 people in the room, but only 30 were sold. The rest were giveaways and, and comps. So, yeah, I mean, I, again, it was a big risk because I could have sold 30 tickets at $20 a pop, right? I would have made what? You know, 600 bucks. Uh, I would have made 200 bucks, you know, yeah. or whatever it was. But um, I knew something was happening and I knew, I knew that people wanted to see me based on this viral video that was continuing, I mean, to Singapore, to Australia, to Canada, I watched it go around the world in a, in a pace that, you know, and right now that one clip, 150 million views. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know many people out there that can say they have a video that has 150 million views. You were doing like improvs in, in clubs and then now you're doing theaters and um, and when you're moving your team, like they they have to bring all the merchandise, and, and that's even that's day of. But the leading up to that, like airfare, figuring out how you're getting everyone to where they need to go, hotels, all that kind of stuff. You're the CEO of the Steve Trevino business, right? So you didn't go to the business school for this. Like, what's 
how do you learn that? Like, what, what, what does that take? I have always had a business mind and I've always had the attitude that I will make more money. So I've always gone, I will spend all of my money knowing that I'm going to work hard and make it back anyway. So I've always had the attitude of like spend it and invest in it and it's coming back anyway. And I've just always been a little businessman. Even when I was a kid, I would go down to the bay, I'd catch shrimp in the morning and I would take my little shrimp bucket to the boat ramp and I, I would sell shrimp to um, the fishermen. So I've always had this business mind of like, oh, I buy a cast net, I go down in the morning, I can make some money, right? So I've always had this entrepreneurial attitude and, and I don't think that, I don't think it can be taught, but I always say that the best thing that has ever happened to me, and I tell my wife this all the time, I used to get called dumb. And I used to, people would tell me, you're dumb and you're not very smart and you know, you're probably not gonna make it in life. I mean, I had people tell me that, that turned out to be very valuable to me because I now look for people, AKA Rick, who are smarter than me in their field, right? And then I also have, the, I also have this mindset of the people around me, I trust them, I believe in them, and that's their expertise. I will let them do their job. And it has, it has worked out very well for me because I don't get in Rick's way when Rick comes to me and says, I want to edit it this way, Steve. And I, I, I literally, and Rick will tell you, I will take a step back from the special completely and go, I trust you to edit this thing in a way that's going to be successful. It's funny because I want your input and you're like, no, 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 that's your lane. You stay in your lane. I'll stay in mine. You don't tell jokes and I'm not going to you know, tell you how to direct this thing. So, um, let's talk about fame for a minute. Uh, the, the interesting thing about fame, because I knew you when you weren't famous, and then now, you know, what, over probably well over 300 million views total on all your stuff, um, you're to the fame now where people are getting famous off you. And we don't have to name names here because I know some of these people like want that that claim, but there's been people who are have millions of followers because they do your jokes on like TikTok or something. Uh, first of all, I, I hate fame. I don't like it. It makes me very uncomfortable. Um, today, for example, we walked into the hotel to have breakfast and the guy that's seating me, as soon as he sees me, I see this. He, he looks up and he does this. <laughs> you know, and I go, I go, hey man. And he goes, Steve Trevino, right? And I go, yes, sir. And he was like, oh my God, you know, I love you. What can I get you? I'll seat you right away. You know, can I get a picture? And, and, and it's, it's, I love taking the picture with them. I love making their day. It's the uncomfortableness that they're uncomfortable around me. And I, I, I don't enjoy that. And I don't, the feeling of, and, and the feeling of being stared at or pointed at or looked at, you know, is very uncomfortable and, and, you know, yesterday I had gone to the Publix here in, in uh, Marco Island and everybody's kind of, you know, looking at me. And, and then this morning at breakfast, that one guy was showing everybody my videos and they're all looking at his phone, looking at me, looking <laughs> at the phone, you know. And, and it's, for me, it's a very, very uncomfortable feeling. However, when other people use it to become famous or on TikTok famous or whatever, I, I have embraced it because all it does is say, sell tickets. And I didn't get in this business to make money. I got in this business because I am truly somebody that likes to make people's days. I love to make people happy. What's weird about the, the TikTok thing is like you've seen musicians do this for years. People would cover their songs and stuff. TikTok is the first time where I've seen someone actually just go and do your bit and put their own spin on it. And it is fascinating it, it's intriguing it's, it's and not only is it intriguing it is one of those things that blows my mind because i'm at the point now where people people are now recognizing my voice and they don't even know what i look like so i will be somewhere and i'll start talking and the person i'm talking to you see them kind of go man you, you sound like this guy that i hear all the time and i go well it's probably me you know 
Um, I had a guy at my house working at the house and you know how I dress with my cowboy hat and I mean, I'm working in the yard. I'm, I'm completely filthy. I'm covered in dirt and grass. And I go back to meet this contractor and he goes, oh my God, man, you look exactly like my favorite comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, I go, who's your favorite comedian? He goes, Steve Trevino, you look exactly. So then I start talking to him. He goes, you sound like him. Oh my God, you look like him. You sound like him. And I go, I go, well, show him to me. And then he shows me and he goes, like, don't you look like him? I go, I go, it's me. And he goes, oh man. He goes, he goes, are you working here too? I go, no, this is my house. And he goes, oh my God. He goes, I thought you were like a worker here at the house. He goes, you have a beautiful house, man. I'm sorry. I go, I go, it's okay, but it, it is. And, and I'm also not famous enough that people lose their shit, which is also weird. Let me jump in there because I'll give you the other side of the fame story because when I'm out with you and we're going like, let's say in Las Vegas and we're walking to the show, I love seeing people come up to you and, and how generous you are. Where I, and, and it was like this with Pitt or Ludacris, all the other people I've worked with, where when you're trying to get business done and people are coming up with you, I have to be the asshole because you're too nice to go and like, right, I wanna take photos with all these people. But I got a crew behind me that's paid by the day and we have a certain things we got to get through. And so I end up having to be the jerk and being like, hey, guys, like he'll, he'll do that later. Just not on my time. You know, my, my, my favorite fan is the guy that walks by and throws a thumbs up. You know, they'll go, hey, man, I love you, dude. And they just keep walking and I keep walking. Right now, the next level to that, which I don't mind is and I always tell people. If you want a picture with a celebrity and you see that celebrity in public, pull your phone, your camera up, put it on selfie, walk over and go, man, big fan, you mind if I get a picture, snap, and then walk off. That is that, you know, that is the easiest if you want a picture. Now, if you want to give a thumbs up, we love that. Hey, thank you. Keep walking, right? But if you do want to get a picture, man, come up, have your phone ready, click, man, thank you for the picture, big fan, walk off, right? But it, it, it makes it difficult when you have people that, and, and you know this through the podcast and, and through my, my socials, we make people our family. So then all of a sudden people go, oh my gosh, you know, I know Delilah's sick. How's she doing? And now I'm, now I'm in the street talking to this complete stranger and they want to know, oh my God, where's Renee? And I hope your daughter's feeling better. And oh my God, when you did this, I, and I, now I'm having this, full conversation and I'm just like, look, I just want to get into the casino so I can play crap. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think fame is affecting your kids? Like, like, first of all, Garrett goes on stage, so you got that whole thing. You can go and sing, you tell jokes, but then just random people asking for your photos gotta be weird as a kid. At, at first, Garrett really thought it was cool. And, and now it, it unfortunately is starting to annoy him. Yeah, he's gonna be a producer. So he's going to be the guy that's like, hey, I got to get to the playground. That, I mean, that's the issue is, you know, we walked into Disneyland, I don't know, last year or whatever. And it was every few, you know, every few minutes. Can I get a picture? Can I get a picture? Can I get a picture? And, and Garrett's doing this like, like, come on, can we please go about our day? You know, but it, there's moments, too, that you can tell that he's like, that's my dad, like, you know, that's cool. My dad takes pictures. And then I always, I always think it's rude. And I always introduce my son, my daughter, my wife, because now they're just standing there uncomfortably. And I go, oh, well, you know, this is my son. This is my wife. Because, but, you know, yeah, Garrett is getting to the point where he's like, <laughs> how, how old is he now? He's seven. Seven. So, you know, even at the hotel last night or yesterday, we decided to go and do the, the resort pool thing. And, you know, Delilah's begging for me to go in the water. And I'm talking to this guy, you know, and his wife. And they're talking to us. And Renee just kind of scurries off and, and, and waves from afar. But, but now I'm stuck. And my kids are like, come, come in the water, daddy. And I'm like, I, I know, you know. And most people are sweet and they get it. And then there's some that just, they're clueless. Yeah. There's times where you're not the most famous in your family. Renee, people will push you out of the way to get a picture with Renee. 
It, it's unbelievable how many people recognize Renee on the streets and I'm not even with them, you know, and somebody will be like, oh my God, Captain Evil, I know you, you know, I love you. And, and she'll take a picture with somebody. And she's like, oh, I just got stopped on Las Vegas Boulevard or I just got stopped at the airport. I'm like, wow, that's really cool to me. You know, my, the kinder, you know, Renee's in a national commercial, as you know, Rick, and our first day of kindergarten last year, the teacher goes, oh my God, I've never had a famous parent. And I puffed my chest out a little bit and I was like, well, you know. <laughs> and she goes, I see your commercials all the time. And then a month later, the teacher comes up to me, she goes, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> You're much more famous than her. I didn't even know you were famous. <laughs> so, it, it, I mean, I love it. And I think it's super cool. And I also think that what we're doing, Rick, is, is something that no comedian has ever done, um, which is introducing all the real family and making pretty much me and my wife and my kids famous through what I do. I, you know, there's comedians shamefully that never talk about their wife, never talk about their kids. You know, there's guys that have huge podcasts. You could watch every episode and they don't talk about their wife. And I don't know if that's by choice or to me, I cannot go and have a conversation without talking about my family and my wife. I have never seen anyone as open as you two. And maybe it's just because I'm privy to some of the podcasts that haven't aired. But uh, there's times where I was like, wow, I, I am shocked that you guys shared that. And then you'll get a response from a comment from a fan who's like, I'm going through that same thing. Thank you for telling it like that, you know, or, or giving me a perspective on it. I, I just, I remember, you know, one of my dad's biggest advice was, he goes, look, man, you know, you be you. And you show people who you are, and at the end of the day, you have nothing to hide, right? And, and high school was a perfect example of that. I mean, all these parents would be like, oh, my God, you know, Steve drinks. Steve drinks. You know, my kid's an angel. And I'm like, uh, your kid's on coke. <laughs> and your kid smokes weed, and your kid drinks way more than I do. The only difference is that they hide it from you. I don't. And I've always lived that philosophy of being an open book and going, look, you can't come at me. Because I, show, I, I tell you everything. You want to come at me about my past? Well, go look at my podcast. Several times in my podcast, I admit that my past was not great, that, my past, that I did things that I regret, that I was not smart, that I did these dumb things. So you want to go after me? Go ahead. I've already admitted those things. Yeah, and you own up to it. So, yeah. you, you know, I'm, I'm an open book. So go ahead and try to dig some shit up on me when I've already said, yeah, I probably wasn't really nice to that girl and I should have been nicer. Or, you know what? I probably got way too drunk and very inappropriate and I'm not proud of it now. But I fucked up. The, the reality of those situations, though, is we all, every one of us, every human being has those moments, right? And it's the fact that you're in the spotlight and, and, and that there's a platform there to even be able to come at you is it. Because there's no single person on this planet that couldn't turn around and, <laughs> and say, well, I, I'm perfect. I've never been mean to someone. I've never, you know, it's just we all have situations we regret. It's unfortunate. No, and, you, and, you re and, and the only thing I can do is, is I always say there is no rearview mirror in life. You know, I just keep moving forward and I look forward. I don't look backwards. And if, if somebody wants to take me back there, I, I'm not going to acknowledge it because it's like, hey, man, my wife knows everything about me, too. My wife knows where I have screwed up and the dumb things I've done. So the only person that can cancel me is her. <laughs> and she has she has forgiven me and we've moved on. You should, too. My favorite thing about going to your shows, well, I have two favorite things about going to your shows, especially when they're back to back to back. So I, I, I know your cadence and everything. I love watching Renee in the crowd when people turn to her. Is there ever a joke that from your side that you wouldn't tell, or is there a line that you know not to cross? Like, how do you, how do you deal with that? I, I, it's been a, it's been a learning process. And again, that's why it's so important to have Renee part of my, my career and my life because I do have a male perspective and I am a very macho male perspective. So there were times that I said or did something that I thought was funny and Renee will come to me and go, ah, you know what? That's really kind of chauvinistic. It's really shitty to say. And, and for example, um, for till death, I had this bit where I go, suck my dick, suck my dick. Right. 
And then I, I, and then one of the lines that I would say is I go, all the bills got paid again <laughs> and you stuck my dick. And Renee came up to me and she goes, you're completely disregarding me as a teammate yeah. and as a partner. I, I contribute to this family too. And now you're saying something that says that just because you pay the bills, you deserve to get your dick sucked. Yeah. It's really it's a shitty thing to say, right? So Renee has always been able to, to, to keep that balance for me of, hey, not, and, and I've been smart enough or dumb enough to, to listen yeah. and go, oh, uh, I see what you're saying. And I was going to say, good on you for, for keeping that open mind and, and, that, and being willing to accept that outside perspective, not having too much of an ego to go like, no, 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 my thing's funny. You, you know, I'm, I'm running with that. It's, it's, it's awesome. And it works, obviously. And, and, it, and it works because when you find out that 70% of my fans are female, I don't want to say something that, that is, that could be meant as, because I completely respect my wife, love my wife. I consider her an equal partner. I don't ever want people to perceive me as somebody that doesn't consider her an equal partner. So, and there's a joke right now that we had to fix that she brought to my attention where I talk about this kid on my baseball team where I go, um, I don't think he's going to be a baseball player. There's going to be balls in his life. They're just not going to be baseball, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's a great joke, but I used to leave it like that. And then Renee would say, you know, it seems a little homophobic. And the point of the joke was me being upset with the dad, right? I'm upset with the dad for not seeing Number one, this kid doesn't want to play baseball. And number two, you might have a, a gay kid on your hands that you need to address and love and care about. Stop forcing them to be a baseball player. That's where my heart is. But when I do the joke at that time, it sounded like I was mad at the kid for being on my team and for being gay. And I'm not mad at the kid. I love the kid. I'm mad at the dad, right? So we rewrote it after Renee brought to my attention that. So now I say... I don't have a problem with Bryson being gay. I have a problem with the dad not seeing what I see. You know, and then I go, look, I love gay people. Yeah. They bring the property value up. We need, <laughs> you know, we need male real estate agents. You know, I, we need employees at Disney. I love them, right? So I had to, I, I had to fix it with her point of view. Had she not told me that, I would have left it the same but she brought it to my attention. The next thing that I love about going to your shows is um, A, the, the fact that you just, when you're in the green room, most people think like it's fun and stuff. You're doing business. How many times you're doing business is insane. So for people to think that you just work one hour at a time, you're working all the time. That's your time to meet people. That's time to being people. But the, and we'll get to that in a second, but I love how You'll be talking and go, oh, I think they called my name. Oh, no. And then you'll get right back into it. And then they call your name. And you're like, all right, I got to go. Like, there's no prep for any of you. Just go. It's crazy. I, I used to be really ashamed to say this because I always felt like it seemed very arrogant. But I'm at a point now where I don't care. Comedy, for stand-up comedy for me is easy. And I used to be ashamed to say that. I used to, I used to actually pretend that I would bomb. Mm -hmm. I would literally like be talking to other comics and be like, yeah, you know, it sucks bombing and it sucks eating, you know, eating it on stage. That's a lie. I've never eaten it on stage. I've never bombed. Comedy for me is easy. I walk on that stage with no script, with nothing written down, with nothing recorded, and I go. Because stand up for me, and I don't want to sound like a dick, even though it sounds like a dick, is easy. The fact that you don't know where some of you, I mean, I know you, you got things you want to hit, but there's times where one time you'll, you'll say a joke and I can't wait to hear it again. And it's gone. It, it's, it, you totally went in a different direction. So no two shows are ever the same. That's why I could sit there back to back to back. And until we're getting to the point, as you know, Rick, cause we filmed together until we're getting to the point where we're going to film it. Yeah. Then I bring Brian, then we start putting it in a perfect order then we start really putting in the work to make sure that every word is perfect, every joke works, you know. But before that, it is, here's a thought. I'm gonna go on stage with this thought. 
here's something that happened at home. How do I turn that into a bit? And it gets some laughs. And then the next show, I fix it, I change it, I put a better order on it, and then it just keeps building and growing and growing and growing and getting better and better and better. Um, but again, it's easy for me. You know, I look at these comics and they can't write material and they get nervous and they have to drink or smoke weed to get on stage. And I mean, it is for me, it's like it literally like riding a bike. I get on and once you're riding a bike, you're not even thinking about it. You're just cruising. And it, it's easy. I'm a relative outsider, right? Rick's seen a lot of your, your stuff live. So I've just seen your specials. Uh, but you can, that, it's a natural ability is what you're saying, right? Like for, for however you've been wired for your life, you know, to be able to do that, it's a, it's a natural ability. It definitely comes through when you're up there. That level of comfortability and what you're saying there. So I, I, I know you're saying like, I don't really want to say it, but it, I don't think there's anything wrong with admitting that's, that's a skill. That's how you've been built. And it's funny because the things I talk about are very simple. So you'll get people in the audience that go, now it makes me feel like I should have been a comedian. It's easy. You just go up there and talk. And I'm like, it's, it's easy for me. Yeah. Give it a try. We'll give it a try. We'll see how it goes. That's a, that's a good point. So Eric, yesterday when we were talking about this today, Eric's favorite joke, it was, it, it, what, what's the, uh, the hybrid one, Eric? Yeah, that your 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 neighbor, you know, your your nosy neighbor or whatever, you tell him it's a hybrid. I, I laughed so hard when I heard that shit. I thought it was brilliant. It burns gas in It's it. brilliant. <laughs> it, it's your K5 blazer, right? That, that, that the reference, yeah. the reference. It's but, so brilliant but I, that especially right now, the timing wise with the world with you know EVs and hybrids and you know the, the the mentalities that are going on, that shit made me laugh hard. Well, and and for me it's like I can I can I can poke fun at the culture without being political, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, like for right now, I'm doing this joke where I go, oh, my fat sister. And then the audience gets quiet and I go, hey, everybody relax. She identifies as fat. <laughs> and then everybody, everybody starts laughing because it's me poking fun at, yeah. hey. That's brilliant. Get, get over it. Get over it. But, but, I, but I also write jokes opposite most comedians. Most comedians write jokes from the funny and I write jokes from the emotion. You know, I write a joke about something that I'm going through or feeling and the troubles I'm having within my own head. How, like for example, how do I raise these privileged kids? That's the question that I've been asking myself in real life. Then I take that emotion, I put it on stage and then I make examples of why it's gonna be hard for me to raise these kids versus the way I grew up. And I come from the emotion side, not the funny side. You know, a lot of guys, they write a funny line or they say something funny and then they build, a, they build all the jokes around that one thing that they said was funny. I'm the opposite. I go, here's something I truly care about and, and I'm going through in my life. How do I make that funny? And then I take it from there to there. And that's why my act right now is very poignant to the point where people go, oh my God, I never thought of that. I'm going through the same thing raising my kids or, oh my gosh, you're helping me become a better father because I never looked at it from that angle. Those are the emotions I'm looking for simultaneously, number one, making their, them laugh their heads off. All right, last question, then we'll let you go. What's gonna define you in the future? Like, tell us what, what the future of Steve Trevino looks like. Man, you know what? I, 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 being a good family man, you know, I, I, I knew you were going to say that, day, by the way. I, I, I think at the end of the day, I would like my son to say and my daughter to say, my dad really tried. You know, my dad, not only did he have a great career, but he gave back and through it all, he was there for us when we needed him. And he worked his ass off to be a good husband, a good father, a good comedian, a good businessman, and the poor bastard never slept. <laughs> I got one question for you, Steve, before we let you go. So my, my dichotomy with doing this stuff with Rick is that I've known him since fifth grade, and I've known all the dumb shit he's ever done. Thank God there was no TikTok. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Fact. No, no, no phones, no uh, cameras on our phones, all that stuff. So glad that's not true. Uh, that wasn't true for us. 
what's the dumbest shit he's done around you? Because the reality is, is I know when he's around, you, I, when he's around you, and a lot of the other people he works with, he has to be very professional. He works toward being very professional. I can, I can answer that. I know Rick's not gonna think what what I, I know what he's thinking. I'm gonna say. Oh, I like this. But it to me, it is that Rick stays so guarded, and I know he's not guarded. And I know that when fun Rick comes out, that Rick thinks that that is not a good Rick, but that's my favorite Rick. Rick is very guarded, and, and, I, and I think that comes from- It's so good looking? Well, no. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> no, I, I think it comes from Rick is this big guy. He's always been a big guy, and big guys are always taught, hey, not so rough. Hey, be careful. Right. And when you're little like me, you're taught, hey, you get in there and don't let him push you around and you speak up and, and you, hey, tackle that guy, hit him as hard as you can, you know. And, and when you're Rick, it's like, hey, hey, they're, you're bigger than them. Right. So conservative, quiet Rick, I prefer, that's the dumbest thing I think he's, he does. Is, <laughs> is really, Just be myself. My take on that is really interesting, Steve, because uh, my take on it is, is exactly what I'm talking about is I think he's constantly trying to filter. Like, so, so part of uh, your take is really interesting. My take is he's filtering out all the dumb shit that he doesn't want to come out, yes. come out of his mouth in order to have what would seem his like pr level of professionalism, right? Be compromised. Like he's concerned about if that. If you knew how dumb I was, we wouldn't be working together. I, I can't tell you how many times I will make an off color joke. And then Rick goes, Jesus. <laughs> I know, but I know he loves it. I know he loves it. Hundred percent. He loves it. Yes, he does. Steve Trevino, thank you so much for doing this, my friend. That has been just a real a pleasure. pleasure, man. You know, I love talking to you, Rick, and and I will say that that I think you would agree. Anybody that that grew up with you, uh, like me, we always end up hanging out with great people, man. And, great. and Eric. Yeah. It, you know, everybody that that Rick meets through me, and everybody I meet through him. It's we're always it's always people who are down to earth, you know, easygoing, fun people. So it, this was fun and easy, man. Thanks, guys. That's right. awesome. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Have a good show tonight. Later, guys. What a good dude. Yeah, he is a good dude. One of the things you and I have discussed that I think is fascinating, and I've seen other comedians talk about it, which is their process, right? Uh, of like, how how do, how are they pulling material? What are they doing? It was interesting because he kind of just organically went went there in terms of like a how just how he is, his talent to be able to be up there, but. Uh, that he's never struggled with being able to tell some of these things, but knowing and understanding, like he starts from the emotional side and then figures out the funny in it, and and it's not always right out the gate. He work he he'll work on it across, you know, gauge the reaction and then continue to meld it, you know, mold it a little bit, you know, for the next show, and the next show, and the next show until it's great. Which um, I was fascinated to hear for me. It's you know, it's also fascinating is how good his memory is, and not just of the past. Like I'll send him a script and be like, hey, we got to read this. This or or hey can we do this you know oh, you know here's a good example he um he was auditioning for a movie and i sent over the script and this script was like three or four pages and most times when you see people they'll have the script in front of them he didn't he was just he went through and it's like uh we had Lindsay on directing it and she was like hey can you can you try this this way this way and he instantly put it in the script. And I was like, oh, he doesn't even have to memorize. It's like, it's part of now. Wow. Wow. That's yeah, crazy. That make well, that makes sense though, in terms of because he was saying, I don't I don't write down I don't write stuff down, I don't go up there with a you know, whatever, whatever. Like I, I, I didn't make the connection at the time because he makes it sound like I'm just free flowing, but there's no question he has his things, right, that he gets to, but but his brain is good enough that he keeps it all up there. Jump yeah, you know, and jump jumps between it. That's impressive. God, I see how people can do like three hour podcasts. Like when you get start, like, again, we scratch yeah. the surface. I, I really want to know like a ton more about the day that yeah. they sunk all their money into a comedy yeah. special right. that it, 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 in, in any world, like it doesn't matter how good you are. Luck plays a part of it, right? Like sure. the fact that it goes viral, if that doesn't go viral, where is he at? Yeah. Like, that's well, always it's fascinating to me. There, no question, luck, timing, all that stuff that goes into those types of things. But, um, but it was also really cool to hear, and that's the like 
you know, uh, never say die attitude, right? That that work ethic, whatever, that he got the word. He sold zero tickets, not for that exact same scenario, but just you get that idea of his level of work ethic and like, I'm not going to let this fail. So I'm, I'm calling everybody I know. I'm going, I'm going to do all the radio shows. I'm doing all that stuff. Like that's, that's why he hasn't, that's why he's successful, right? It's literally a building block that was a piece to get him to where he's at today. All right, let's wrap this up. Goodbye, everyone. See ya. <laughs> I don't know. How do you end these things? I, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, bye. No, no, I can't. <laughs> no, no, I can't. <laughs>